So, first of all, uh, you know, thanks to Vitalik and Vlad for uh, asking me to come, and it, it's it's great to be here. I'm, I'm glad to, glad to be able to deliver a few impressions. I think in, in 25 minutes, that's all I can do is is deliver a few impressions. Uh, Vlad and I've been working a, a lot on Casper, um, and and the kind of the, the technologies and, and tools and ideas that I'm bringing to the formal verification of Casper are also uh, embodied in, in some of the ideas that I'll be presenting here. So um, kind of the, you know, just want to touch on the, the, an overall narrative and then, and really, if you, if you walk away with nothing else, I want to leave you with this one big picture idea. Um, but, but, you know, in the details, there's enough space for God and the devil, right? So there's always lots and lots of space in the, in the details. And, and maybe talk about some next steps. So that's kind of what we're going to do. And the narrative is actually a fairly simple one. It's fairly straightforward. A consensus is a necessary component of the blockchain. So you heard Vlad talk uh, rather eloquently about consensus and some of the problems there. Um, it, it turns out, I mean, I think, I think many of the people here know that, that blockchain currently, you know, a, a, as embodied, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't scale very well. And Casper's variation of the proof of stake is an important step along the way towards scaling. I wouldn't say that it's, it's the solution to scaling, but it's, it's one component of, of a scaling solution. Um, and so, so we, we want to look at proof of stake, and in particular the, the, the Casper variant of proof of stake, uh, and really bash on it from the, from the point of view of, of formal verification. So we'd, we'd, we'd like to know for sure, once and for all, whether Casper enjoys certain properties. Um, and so we're, 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 one of the tools that we're using to go about this is something called the Applied Pi Calculus. Um, and this gives us, and, and I'll show uh, kind of where we are in, in the state of that uh, later in the talk, but this gives us access to automated support for proof of correctness. So the tools that we're uh, employing right now in, in include uh, ProVerif, but, but um, much more the Spatial Logic Model Checker, which was developed by Luis Cares. Um, and uh, uh, that, that turns out to be good fun, and if you want to look at the code, uh, it's up on GitHub, and I'll, I'll give you a link a bit, a bit later. But it turns out that if you have a spec in the applied pi calculus, well, I have a bunch of libraries that up on GitHub called Special K, and they are an implementation, an, an, uh, an, an executable distributed virtual machine of the applied pi calculus. So if you have a spec, you can turn it straight into an implementation. So if you have a spec that you can reason about the, the correctness properties, then you can actually run Casper. Um, and so this, this is, has big implications for the correctness of an implementation. What you get is correct by construction. And that's, that's, a, that's a different approach to design than I think uh, you know, happens uh, in a lot of um, software, a lot of the software industry, but in, but in particular in this space. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that uh, um, the blockchain as originally conceived was, was done in a correct by construction style. I think it was quite, quite the opposite actually. Um, but, but if you take on correct by construction, one, uh, this helps with scaling. There, there are a lot of different aspects to scaling, right? It's not just about volume and performance. Right. It's also about um, when, when you have reliability, reliability is what engenders adoption. Right. So you think, think about it. You're, 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 um, you're someone who manages a large financial firm, and there's this great new technology that promises wonderful things, but am I going to swap it out for the thing that works? Well, I might be more inclined to do that, uh, take, take on some of that risk if I knew that it had certain reliability properties that were formally and automatically verified. Um, it also helps uh, with, uh, with uh, maintenance and evolution because, as we know, this space is changing very fast. And so it's kind of important to be able to, to uh, adapt uh, the code to the needs of the space. Um, so, uh, it turns out that uh, in addition to some of these benefits, um, Special K provide already, of its own, provides a broad range of transactional semantics. 
And, and we get these because of the monadic decomposition of the, the elements that are, that are used to, to make these kinds of transactions. And, and I'll, I'll go through those. But you know, there's, there's basically a handful of programming uh, paradigms that are used successfully today in building uh, distributed systems. And, and it turns out that you can organize all of those under a single rubric, under essentially a single API. Um, additionally, uh, the compositional nature of the, uh, of the, the pi calculus, uh, so I'm just g giving you some sense of all the benefits of, of this kind of approach, makes it possible to write down in a single page a metered distributed concurrent VM. So just for fun, I'll show you that spec right at the end. Ooh, that's some nice feedback. That's some really nice high frequencies. Um, okay, so, so the big picture is that compositionality is the key to scaling any system. So if you forget every, everything else in this talk, if you remember that one idea, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to plant that seed in your mind and, and go home and think about that. So what the hell is compositionality? Is it even a word? Right? If, if <laughs> spell check is going to underline it in red, I guarantee you. Um, so let me, let me kind of unpack this idea. So, so in computing, I think we're all familiar with the idea that scaling refers to lots and lots of copies of, of things that are you know, potentially not reliable individually. Right? So lots of chips, lots of boxes, lots of uh, databases, lots of servers, lots of data centers, right? So that's the traditional, you know, uh, high volume, high performance uh, notion of scaling. Compositionality turns this upside down. And what it says is that scaling is about making the, the large reflect the small, right? And, and every child understands this idea. They hold up the leaf, they look at the leaf, and they say, hey, there's a tree inside this leaf, right? Um, and that is, in fact, how nature scales. And we see it again and again and again. And it's kind of funny, why is it that we forget? We knew this at one point, and then we forget it. And why is it that we forget this? Well, it turns out that it's actually a fairly new thing for culture to remember this. Um, so I, I'm just giving you a few examples from pop culture of, of this idea, and you'll notice that all of them, I mean, even Mandelbrot sets are very new on, culture, on the cultural landscape, right? And just to give you another sense of how, how interesting and different this way of thinking is, so here's a bunch of people who had computationally very effective ideas, right? So you know, maybe you know, maybe you recognize Paul Dirac, uh, maybe you recognize Erwin Schrödinger. But quantum mechanics, as formulated in those days, was not compositional, and it's only been in the last five years that we've had a compositional formulation or presentation of quantum mechanics via Samson Abramsky and Bob Kuka. Uh, a similar thing has happened uh, uh, in the physics of the large, uh, gravitation and cosmology, and because we don't have good compositional accounts. Physics fails to scale. We don't have a nice way to marry those two ideas. So if you're feeling like, hey, I'm not quite sure what compositionality is, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, well, these guys didn't either. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of okay. Um, but what I can say is that the notion of composition has, has nice for formalizations. So in the, since about the 1950s, there's been an appropriately parametric notion of composition that was formulated uh, first in category theory, and it was given this weird, crazy name of a monad. Um, if, you, if you pair monads with their dual mathematical widget, the co-monad, you can think of them, so composition is kind of like nesting, right? It's like the Russian dolls. You, you nest, you, you know, it's like the, 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 the tree inside the leaf and the leaf inside that tree and the tree inside the leaf, right? So it's about nesting. And, and what, what monads and co-monads give you, monads give you a way to zoom out and co-monads give you a way to zoom in on this nesting phenomena or this composing phenomena. And lest you think I'm talking about abstract, airy-fairy stuff, um, again, I'm just, all I can do in 25 minutes is give you a few impressions, right? So, so here are effective uh, uh, 
APIs expressed in the language Scala. You can find similar expressions in the language Haskell. Just out of curiosity, how many people code in functional languages here? Awesome. How many people use monads in their daily practice? Yeah, uh, uh, quite a few less. Yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, but but the, the, the point is that they are an effective notion, and they're a great way to structure your code, even if you're not thinking about uh, uh, scaling blockchains. They're, they're a great way to structure container code. They're a great way to, construct, uh, to structure control flow. Um, but it turns out that, that we can do better than that. So in particular, a special K, uh, KVDB, um, looks at a duality between continuation, which is the rest of your program. So let's say your program walks up to the blockchain and says, I'm looking for something, right? And what if that something isn't there yet? What do you do with that program that, that is, is waiting for data and can't go further, right? So in special K, what happens is the rest of that program is packaged up as a piece of data and stored at, at the place where, you, where it was looking for something, right? So that's the continuation. And then data is dual to that. And in fact, you can have a notion of data integrity that, that goes all the way back to the law of excluded middle, right? A or not A, right? That has to do with um, this duality between continuation and data. So at this location that you're looking for, this address on the blockchain, or in the case of special K, it's a, it's a more sophisticated kind of key. But at this location, you will either have a continuation or some data. And if, if a program is looking for, uh, for data and it's not there, the continuation will, will be stored there. If a program is depositing data, if there is a continuation there, that continuation will be woken up and handed the data. Okay, that's the basic setup, right? Now, you can ask some questions about that setup. You can say, well, after the data and the program, the continuation meet each other, what happens? And there are, there are only a handful of possibilities. One is the data disappears and the continuation disappears. So they meet each other in this abstract space, this, this address, and they go poof. All right. Another possibility is that the continuation remains and the data goes poof. Another possibility is that the continuation goes poof and the data remains. And the last possibility, of course, is that they, they both persist. Right? So, so what, is, what does that have to do with um, uh, traditional uh, approaches to distributed applications? Well if, it, well, if the data persists and the continuation evaporates, that's just traditional deep, uh, database operations. Think about a read, right? My program wants the data. I read it, but I don't get rid of it out of the database just from the read operation, right? That's, that's traditional database operations. If I publish and, and, uh, and the, the, the publishing data is ephemeral, but the continuation persists, that's ordinary publish and subscribe. That's ordinary publish and subscribe. And if, they, if both of them persist, it's publish and subscribe with a history, with a backlog of what you published. And finally, this is quite interesting, if they, if they both disappear, then you get item level locking in a distributed transactional semantics. So one API, which I sh uh, showed you, nothing up my sleeves, right? One API, the, the monadic API, covers all of those distributed uh, programming paradigms. So now, how does this apply to the blockchain? Um, well, that, that, that how we provide that is that the continuation monad is the, is the monad underlying being able to bring those, those patterns together, right? So we talked about this duality between con continuation and data. Well, it's the, con it's the structuring of the continuations and the way we store them that uses the continuation monad uh, to, provide the, to provide that unification of all those programming paradigms. And, and so we looked at that API. It turns out that if you just tilt that API on its side a little bit, what you end up getting is the applied pi calculus. And that's exactly how special K is organized. So if you look at special K, if you go to GitHub right now and you look at special K, what you'll find is a little DSL that provides an implementation of the applied pi calculus. So, 
But here's a little preview of applying that API to Casper. So I, I spent last night and refactored this. I had good fun. Um, so let's see if I can, can you see that? Oh, that's, that's all right. So I'm just gonna, again, I only have time to give you a flavor. So here are the files in the spec. And let's take a look briefly at just uh, some of them. So in, in Casper, the consensus protocol is organized around nodes, which we think of as, as validators. And what a validator wants to do is essentially uh, receive blocks and then make bets on whether or not a block should be published to the, to the, um, uh, to the, to the blockchain. And here's, here's basically just an applied PyCalculus spec of the betting and the, the convergence around betting uh, spec uh, for the validator. We can, uh, there are similar, and you can see how tiny it is. It's, it's teeny tiny. Um, this, uh, this, wow, we're all, are already at two minutes. Okay, come see me afterwards and I'll show you probing this spec for properties. Okay, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll cut, to the, cut to the chase. So I was gonna give you a demo, but I would like to just take, take a, 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 just come, come see me afterwards and I'll, I'll give you a, a lot more of the, the flavor of the spec and how, how we can probe it automatically with the spatial logic model checker. But I would like to conclude by just taking you through a little bit, taking these same kind of specs and using the compositional structure, we can walk this structure, we can essentially build up a new semantics from the existing semantics in a nice, clean, careful way. So I took the, I took the uh, uh, essentially a variant of the applied pi calculus and I added to it metering. And this metering basically uses three elements. So there's a resource, there's a, there's a, and a channel for the exchange of the resource, and there's a channel for the next step. That next step is again an encoding of a continuation. And what, what we see here is essentially just, just a, a tiny little harness for, for running uh, a metered uh, VM. We run inside that harness the translation of our, of our little tiny API for, for uh, contracts, right? But this, this API and this contract language is a little different. And the reason it's different is because contracts can be uh, uh, executed in parallel, uh, contracts uh, have, have other interesting properties in that contracts themselves can be reified and exchanged. Um, the important point here, again, I'm happy to go through all the details with you offline, but the important point here is the size of this spec. And not only the size of this spec, but the correctness properties of this virtual machine can be stated and proved in about a half a page. Right, so even more interestingly, you can take this kind of virtual machine and bootstrap. So you can build this virtual machine on top of this virtual machine. Now it would be interesting to look at, look at doing that with the existing VM. That would be an interesting question. Could we build the Ethereum blockchain on top of the existing VM? Does it bootstrap? And that, 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 that brings us back to the point I was trying to make at the very beginning. Do we have this self loop, right? Because that's your first and best test that you can scale. So the big picture that I want to leave you with is that, is that compositionality, this, this kind of finding the small and the large, the large and the small, is the key to scaling any system. So thank you.